In section 4.1, we learned about correlation and scatter plots. And what's more, we learned that the value of r, the correlation coefficient, can tell us whether our data set was, uh, had a positive or negative relationship, and also how strong it was, whether it was strong or moderate or weak. And remember when we did this problem, we had these lines drawn into these graphs, and they helped us gauge the strength of our relationships. So now in section 4.2, we want to take a closer look at those lines. What are those lines? Where do they come from? What makes them the best line? So that's what we want to look at in 4.2 with least squares regression. Now, least squares regression is the term that we use to describe the line of best fit, the, the least squares regression line. And we'll learn a little bit about why it's called that in a couple pages. But it is the best line um, for various reasons. And it's also known as the regression line. Sometimes it's called the trend line, the line of best fit. They all mean the same thing. They all mean this magical best line. All right, well, the equation for that line is y hat equals ax plus b, where it's not y equals. You're used to algebra. You're used to y equals mx plus b. But we're using y hat because the y values are actually the scatter plot y values. The y hat is the trend line. It's like an average. So you're using the y hat with a little um, caret on its head, little caret symbol. And then ax plus b instead of mx plus b. So we've just modified slightly the letters we're using. All right, now the slope is a. And then I've written a whole bunch of other stuff here. So slope is a measure of the steepness of the line. That's what it is, right? Bigger number, the steeper it is. You use that for uh, driving cars, for the grades on ski hills, right? The grades on slopes of um, handicap ramps and uh, rooftops, they all have a slope to them. That's a number that you can measure. For our purposes, we want to remind ourselves that slope is A over 1, because whatever that number is, you can always put it over 1. And that's rise over run, right? which is vertical change over horizontal change. And in science class, you might have learned change, the symbol for change is this little triangle. It's, it's the Greek letter delta. It means change. And what that means is subtract. That's what that means. So we subtract y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 if you're in an algebra class. We're not going to bother because we're not in an algebra, so we're not just going to have two points as a general rule. So let me go show you the picture right here. So if we have a run, the run for us will always be 1, no matter what. We're going to set that run at 1. And then the rise will be whatever A is, A being our slope. So that'll be the lift that we have. So slope will be rise over run. It's the vertical lift of your line compared to the horizontal lift or horizontal run over that same time frame. Every line, of course, has its own steepness factor. So rise over run. All right, now how do we interpret that other than it's a measure of steepness, which is true, but not really useful for us? Well, if it's positive, then what you say is that on average, if x increases by 1, so I'm writing out what the run means in words. So if x increases by 1, then my rise, my y, is expected to increase, if it's positive, by approximately a. Now, if my slope is negative, then I'm going to use the word decrease. So don't write increase or decrease. Choose whichever one's appropriate for your problem. So if you have positive slope, write the word increase. If you have negative slope, write the word decrease. Use whichever one's appropriate. But the important thing to note here, a couple of things. One, you say on average. You're kind of accommodating for the fact that this is a trend line. This isn't perfect. You're not an algebra class. So it's kind of squishy. So you're saying on average, this is what we expect. That's also why the word expected is in there. Right? It's kind of showing squishiness. That we're not 100% sure of what's going on. We're just kind of seeing a trend. Then we explain the run right here with x, always using the number 1 and the rise right here with that phrase. Now before I go any further, you'll notice that the x and the y are in quotes. So you might be thinking to yourself, what does that mean? 
What that means is I don't want you to write the letters X and Y. Again, we're not in algebra. So if you're given context, then you should write out what that context is. So you write out what your explanatory variable was in words, right? So what was your explanatory variable for that problem's context with words? And then for the Y, you write out the response variable in context, right? So for the problem's context with words. There you go. So don't use X and Y. I mean, unless you have to. If you're not given a context, then fine, use X and Y. But if you're given a story problem with context and real life data, then you should be using words and, and English to explain what those variables were. All right, now before I go any further, um, the Y intercept is where the line will hit the X axis, right? So that's, or excuse me, hit the Y axis. There you have it. So what does that mean? Because that's not going to cut it. Well, what that means is that when the x value is 0, the y is expected to be approximately b. So if you look down here at the graph down here, so you can see when you intersect the, uh, the y-axis, excuse me, your x value will always be 0. Your y value will be whatever your y-intercept value would be, which in this case is b. Now, one thing to note before I go any further is that, and I have it as the fourth bullet, I think, up there, which is that sometimes, for whatever reason, the y-intercept doesn't actually make a lot of sense in the context of the problem, right here, the fourth one. If that's the case, then explain why, right? Why does it not make sense? What's going on in the situation that would make, let's say, the x equals 0 be impossible? That's, that's actually a pretty common one. Usually, it's the x value being 0 that just doesn't make any sense. So explain why. Or explain why the B being whatever it is is impossible, or both. Fine. All right, so that's how to interpret the y-intercept. And again, notice x and y are in quotes. That means that you'll actually use words and context for them. You're not going to write the letters. One other thing to note is that we are never, never going to find the regression equations by hand. They're too much of a pain, it's not really in the scope of our course. So we're going to use our calculator or Excel to find them, depending on whether you're in homework or a project. Alright, one last thing to note before we leave this, which is that the regression model, um, we use regression models and trend lines to make predictions. That's kind of the value that they have for us, is that we can kind of go a little bit outside of the data. So if you look at this graph down here, these green dots, that's our data. Great. And you can go a little bit ahead of that data or a little bit before it, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, no problem. But if you go too far away from the data that you know, right, if your x values get too far above or below, too high or too low, then you can get into trouble because you're making predictions that are too far away from what you know about. And that can get you into big trouble, right? So it's called being outside the scope of the model. The scope of your model is really between the points that you have. I would argue you can make a little bit of a jump outside of that, just a touch, you know, just a, a, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left of your points, you're okay. But going much past that, is problematic. You don't want to get far outside of the points that you actually know about. And that's what this is making a comment about.